Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Hi everyone and welcome to our next Agronomy Week session. Um, I'm going to be your host for this one. I'm Michelle and I'm a Knowledge Exchange Manager in cereals and oilseeds covering the Northwest and Northern Ireland. Um, this session is focusing on yield resilience in climate extremes. The weather's been a big challenge for a number of seasons and you don't have to look very far to see that. And I'm sure many, if not all of you have experienced drought, flooding, both maybe even in the same season or maybe even more than once. Um, so I went away thinking about this session and I went to our AHDB weather hub and I wanted to have a look at what we had got in terms of information about it. So this graph shows the mean of annual rainfall across the horizontal axes and the mean average sunshine across the vertical axes. And each point on this graph represents a year between 1919 and this year and as you can see we're starting to see years that sh show more sunshine or more rain and in some cases both so this is what's happened already um but what's the future what are the projections so for this i went and had a look at the met office predictions so the headline of the uk cp18 is that there's going to be a greater chance of warmer wetter winters and hotter drier summers and periods of extreme winter rainfall are going to, going to become seven times more likely. Icing days where the maximum temperature is below zero have become five times less likely. And we're more than 30 times more likely to have the record breaking summers like we experienced in 2018. With all of that in mind, yield resilience is going to become vital um, and we're going to have to build that into our farming systems. So I've got three great speakers lined up for this session. Firstly, Dave Blacker, who farms and contracts in York, covering 2,000 acres, and he also carries out his own agronomy. He was the York Monitor Farmer from 2014 to 2017, uh, where he focused on soil health improvement. And he recognised that he needed to make changes to his establishment techniques in order to future-proof his system. Uh, so he's moved to a strict tillage system. Next up will be David Clark, who is the Soils and Farming Systems Senior Research Technician at NIAB and also a PhD student with Cranfield University, looking at site season effects on crop product productivity. The understanding of which would allow us to make better decisions going forwards. And finally, we've got Dr. Jake Bishop from the University of Reading, who studies how crop production is affected by stressful weather conditions, which is oh so relevant. Um, and along with his research group, he aims to deliver the understandings of threats to production and help growers learn how to adapt to unfavorable weather conditions as they become more common. So we've got a great session lined up. And as was in the video, you can send in your questions throughout, um, but we will have a formal question period later in the session. 
So I've said plenty um, and we've got some great things to hear. So to start off with, I'm going to hand over to David to talk about how he has been affected by climate and how he's built resilience into his farming system. Yeah, afternoon, everybody. I'll uh, I'll wade straight into this PowerPoint because I've got quite a lot to get through. Um, so yeah, we've just uh, just heard from Michelle. The seasons we're getting now, uh, the, every year seems to be a record-breaking year for one reason or another. Either the hottest year since wherever, or the wettest year since wherever. And we're out there in the fields trying to farm in amongst all this and, and trying to make the right decisions that are going to um, try and try and deliver us the best yield that we can achieve uh, with everything that's going on around us. And all these things, we have nothing, no control over the weather whatsoever. We can't put a big umbrella over the farm. Um, back in the olden days, I used to farm a bit like this. Uh, I used to do a lot of ploughing. It was slow. It was expensive. I used to do a lot of cultivation. I was losing lots of moisture, making far too fine seed beds. Um, and uh, it was um, it was obviously putting a lot of compaction in the soils. Uh, if I got a crop established and it rained quite heavily, all the fine particles used to run together and end up with a field that looked a bit like this, um, which is you know, all down to too much cultivation and uh, all the soils running together uh, after a big downpour of rain. Uh, and then some years we had fields that looked like that, and that was 2012. Um, uh, I remember we, what sometimes we forget in 2012 is that we actually had a drought as well that year. And I remember watching the weather forecast and the guy from Yorkshire Water saying, no amount of rain is going to fill this reservoir back up. And then it all came all at once. Um, and, the, you know, these these fields, I can't help but think that the situation we were in that year, I, I made my situation a lot worse by uh, by ploughing the fields and um, smearing it underneath with the share and, and sealing the soil up. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the problems I ended up having, I actually just came to the conclusion I was making a lot of the problems myself. Yeah, uh, you had poor soil structure, I had compaction, I had land that was prone to pack capping and slumping. If I went in and ploughed and combi drilled a field, I had immediately had two pans, one from the plough and one for the power horror. Uh, poor water infiltration because of it that led to shallow rooted crops. And it was time to do something different for me because we were getting um, almost every other season was a wet season. And if it wasn't wet, it was dry. And sometimes you had both together. Uh, and um, it, well, it just wasn't working for me in the in the the way I used to cultivate. So since autumn 13, I've been strip tillage. Um, and uh, when we come to look at um, building resilience into my my yields and not only that, my fields, um, I'm doing a lot of anal analysis on the on the yields of my fields. Um, from this, I can tell uh, what each, how each, not only how each field is performing, but how each crop is performing. So farming under the conditions we are, I can immediately see that the Overton one there I've highlighted in red on the right, uh, it's got a yield of 6.8 tonnes of hectare average on wheat and cow pasture 6.62 average on wheat and neither of them are really good enough. Uh, Overton one being my lightest field I've got and it droughts off when it's dry and cow pasture being one of the heaviest ones I've got and it just sits too wet for too long. So by analysing these yield figures I can start to make um, conscious decisions about what I'm going to do with these fields going forward. And if you look at this by crop you can see, um, if you look at the all seed rate, my average all seed rate for 11 years there, it's 3.34 tonnes a hectare. And if you take out the 2010, 2011 yields off that, it's probably even worse than that. So, uh, so I've actually looked at um, stewardship um, as a, an alternative for these fields that aren't performing for me. And I've really looked at all the options in there as a different crop in the rotation. And I've taken the worst fields out and I've entered into the bean schemes and I'm using legume fallows to improve my organic matter and my soil structure. Uh, I'm using the overwinter stubble to replace some of my rape area because it, it pays better than my average rape yield um, across the years. Uh, and wild, wild bird food field on the lighter wild bird food on the lighter fields at 640 pound hectare, there's not a lot not to like about that. Um, so when it comes to building resilience into the system that I've got coming from where I've been, then I've started to chop crop residues uh, after every crop, which quite often makes me one of the most hated uh, people in the Vale of York when there's lots of livestock farmers around here. Uh, I'm growing cover crops, and I have been since 2012. The pictures you saw earlier, I followed uh, the flood in there with Facilia, and that was my first experiment with cover crops. Um, Targeted subsoiling. So if I've got compaction, I'm not doing whole fields anymore. I'm finding out where it is and I'm targeting that specifically. Uh, and I'm putting, uh, if I can get it, I'm putting compost additions on and I've started doing quite a lot of field drainage. 
So cover crops for me are very much about protecting the soil service and improving the structure. Um, it just prevents the soil from capping, uh, keeps all the soil together, keeps it all alive. Um, this will be a standard mixture that I would normally plant, uh, clover, buckwheat, radish, oats, phacelia, sunflower. If I was planted in September and I was putting this in, I'd probably choose to drop the buckwheat and the sunflower because they're not likely to get big enough to do you any good, especially when buckwheat's killed at the first frost we get. Uh, so if you get an early frost, that's a bit of a waste of money. Um, compost I've been applying uh, quite regularly. As often as that, I can get it as long as ground conditions are dry enough to spread it without making a mess. And that, that's a lot of what it comes down to. Um, when I was a monitor farmer, I did do a trial on one field. I did the same field every year for four years. And over the four-year period, I put 140 tonnes uh, per hectare of organic material on this field. Uh, and it cost about just under five grand to do the, do the trial. And it did. It has built a lot of resilience into that field. The crops I get off that, the, the bigger, lusher, better crops coming out of winter. Now you can see on this biomass map, the first one taken in spring, uh, the big the big uh, field that sticks out at the bottom, the green ones, the one that's got the massive biomass. The green's lots of biomass, red's not so much biomass. Um, so it really has had a massive difference to that field, except I'm not seeing any real increases in yield because of it. So although I'm getting, I'm getting uh, a field that, um, can take the weather better and the crops that come out of the winter better, bigger biomass. Um, I'm, I'm not actually seeing a financial benefit from an increased yield because of because of doing that. Uh, um, I started to use a penetrometer quite a few years ago now, which is really quick and easy to get compaction layers and where you've got it. So I'm really on targeting uh, where I'm doing the subsoil and it's generally on headlands. Um, and I'm also looking a lot more at the soils and looking at what I'm doing to the soils and how my soils are performing. So I'm doing visual examinations. And when I do that, I'm doing worm counts and I'm doing bulk density tests uh, in situ on farm. Uh, and that's that's uh, putting a bit more information in the background for me on my porosity of the soil and how it's how the soils are um, coping with the weather patterns we're getting. Uh, I'm looking at organic matters. And it was all going really well until autumn 2015. We had another really wet year. Um, and when York floods, my crops look a bit like this. And it start, then it was time for plan B in this field. And the problem in there really was we had some really big downpours at autumn. And it was silt separation on the surface of the soil. Actually, the structure underneath wasn't that bad, but it just sealed up the top. The water couldn't get through it. It was just like putting a layer of cling film over the top of your soil. Uh, and all that wheat crop died off. And uh, so where do you go after that? Well, it's time to get the soil defibrillator kit out of its bag. And I followed that field. Uh, it was too wet to get anything on in, a crop in there in spring. So uh, I just filled it full of cover crops and I put different mixes, different species, put them in strips just to see what each different um, each different species was going to bring to the mixture and what he was going to do to the soil. And at the end of it, I suppose, really, there was no one mixture that was better than the other. I came to the conclusion that a mixture of all of them was probably the best way to go and get different architecture from the different routes. Um, <clears throat> and they were, they were really there to try and improve the um, the resilience of that field, improve its infiltration. So I'm trying to build up bigger pores, uh, improve the porosity, the gaps in the soil. And in doing that, I'm hoping to, and um, now I'm not cultivating as well, I'm hoping to improve its permeability, which is how the water flows through the soil. And all in all, the clays are written, the clay soils after what eight years now stripped in the clays are restructuring really well. It's the sands I need to watch. The sandy soils are um, self compacting if um, if I don't keep an eye on them. And if they're self compact, you know, I'm, I may know grounds about it. I'll just go in with the subsoiler and lift them. <clears throat> it still brings me back to the point that the most restricting factor I've got on the farm is my field drainage and the fact that I've got some very old 1960s drains that are all starting to fail and collapse. Uh, and also, uh, there's not enough backfill on them, and the, the subsoil I've got above them is the kind of thing you'd want to line up on with. And the, unfortunately, the rainfall, especially when we get the big deluges, you just can't get to the drains fast enough. Um, so that is one of my my biggest downfalls on what is generally a you know, clay loam-based uh, soil type. Uh, so I started doing some annual drainage with a contractor. More often than not, he didn't turn up. And when he did turn up, he sent me horrible bills that I didn't like. So um, because I had so much to do, I actually decided uh, three years ago that I would invest in my own kit and do it myself. Uh, so it's quite a lot of capital investment all in one go. You know, drain trencher, stone cart, digger, trailer to move the digger. Um, but now I'm up and running. I'm trying to budget to do 20 acres a year, and I'm also picking a bit of contracting work up with that, and I'm rolling that money back into doing my own drainage to make it a bit more affordable. 
Um, and I just can't get around it fast enough. Um, I remember the first system I did, I was sat there watching it after a big rain running into the drainage chamber. And I could have sat there all day and watched it. I'd never seen water move off the farm like it. It was incredible. Uh, so that, from that respect, you know, the drainage sides can become quite addictive. Uh, I can't get around it fast enough. I think that's all from me. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you, David. It's um, great to hear how you've coped with the challenges of the climate and how you've progressed your system into one that is more resilient. And that is what we are aiming for, really. Um, and that's what David, who's coming up next, is going to discuss. So um, I will add, if you've got any questions about how David Blacker has changed his system and, and how he sees the future for him, uh, do send them in using the questions answer function. Uh, but for now, we'll move on to David Clark, who's going to share an example of resilience and introduce some projects that will help us understand what drives variability and how we can use that information going forwards. Hello everyone, um, I'm David Clark. I work uh, in the NIAB Soils and Farming Systems Research Team based at Morley in Norfolk, so we're slightly further south from David Blacker. Um, and I've also started a centre-funded PhD at Cranfield University working with BGS, NIAB and the Morley Agricultural Foundation, which I'll introduce briefly at the end. But today I sort of want to talk about resilience, what I define resilience as, um, have a look at some examples of resilience at Morley uh, on a, a sandy loam soil in Norfolk, and then introduce the, the Morley Sams project that's looking at sort of variation in yields across farm within fields, similar to what David's just talked about in terms of his benchmarking fields across years. And then introducing two new projects, firstly my PhD and then some work we're doing at Strategic Farm East looking at marginal land and how that might be useful going forward with the ELM scheme. So why is resilience important? Well, although we don't know what this season's challenge will be, if anything, the last few years has taught us is that there will be challenges. These are all photos from trials taken in Norfolk over the last year or so. Um, and we're all familiar with last autumn. We saw consistent rainfall, made autumn very op autumn operations very difficult. And there's a winter wheat trial of ours there that suffered for that. Um, we had a very warm winter this year, uh, and therefore we've seen some quite bad virus yellows in sugar beet, partially down to the mild winter, allowing high aphid populations. Move forward to harvest this year, we saw a lot of our oat crops go over with some storms and heavy rain in August. Uh, and we've met off predictions, well, not just predictions, but we're seeing that storms are becoming heavier and more frequent. And then if we go back a little further to 2018, at our NIAB weather station in Cambridge, we actually recorded no rain for 58 days between June and July. So we've got all that to deal with. OK, so we don't know when or, or what the challenge will be, but we certainly know there will be challenges and we know that they can be costly. So some work we've done at Cranfield shows that using a calibrated uh, wheat crop model for, for Cambridge on a soil that's very representative of wheat growth. We saw that the frequency of drought and the impact on a wheat crop were quite large. Obviously, you can see some noticeable years, 1976, a, a fan favourite. Uh, I'm not sure anyone remembers 1921, but then more recently, as David mentioned, the droughts of 2010, 2011. So what this shows is that actually on average, representative sort of drought is costing around about £100 a year in yield loss. Sometimes this is nothing, sometimes it's five times this. The problem is that we can't apply a fungicide or a bit more nitrogen that we do with some other challenges. So how do we factor this in to our, our systems? But what it does show is that it pays to be it pays to invest in resilient systems. So what do we mean by resilient systems? Well, the, the, the principles are reasonably clear. A, re a, re a resilient system is an area or a system that is high relative yields and can buffer against external forces. So if we look at the, the green line here, in a, this is just looking at one example, rain in July, it, it, it buffers against different ver, um, variations in rainfall and maintains high yields. An unstable or non-resilient soil is something that doesn't buffer very well. So as rainfall increases here in July, yields go down. But then we've also got those areas that may be stable, but are generally low yielding. Now, these offer different challenges. We need to understand whether these are our reduced yields are of a natural variation or they're because of management. So we can learn from this. Maybe these are the places we might um, 
use schemes such as ELMS, and this is something we'll look at going forward. The high areas are something we can learn from. What's driving the yield resilience? Can we mimic that on other areas of the farm, particularly the red areas, and how do we do that? So looking at one example at Morley that we, we've found from, from the Morley Sounds project, here we see a, an area of a field um, from the 1946 aerial survey. We can see what we've assumed to be arable cropping in the red area and then permanent grass around the woodlands. We can see some trees in the field uh, prior to 1946. We move on to the next aerial survey in 1988. We see that that area has all returned to arable cropping. Um, so the whole the hedge has been taken out and, and we've gone to a serial rotation predominantly. So we know lot sometime between the last 33 years or over 33 years ago that we had a conversion of permanent grass to arable situation. So what does this mean for yields? Well, in a good year, so 2019, wheat yields were well over 12 tonnes. We don't really see any, any need for resilience. Everything performed well. The crop had everything it needed to to grow. Now, if we go to a challenging year, we're looking at 2011 here, one of the driest years in East Anglia, certainly in the last 100 years, we saw very little rainfall after a, a 2011 spring wheat yields on the farm. However, we saw about a resilience factor of about 1.5 tonnes on the area that used to be permanent grass. And we're talking 40, 50 years ago. So we can get some ideas why this might be organic matter, things like that. But without understanding what's really going on, we can't then look to mimic and, and, and apply this across farm. So the Morley Agricultural Foundation with NIAB set up the Morley Soil and Agronautic Monitoring Study, the Morley Sounds Project. We started this in, in 2018. And the idea is that we examine the impact of modern agricultural practice at a farm scale on productivity across the rotation on soil health and the overall farm sustainability. So the idea is we're going to collection of long term monitoring data sets for a network of soil and agronomic monitoring sites. You can see from this aerial photography that how, how we sort of the idea of this. We've got a couple in this field. They're about 15 by 15 meters squared. Uh, and then they've got fifth, they've got six squares around that are all performed very similar. So we're not just getting very isolated pockets of variation and through Sorry, uh, and, and these were identified by using historic yield maps. So a lot of farms now over the last 10, 15 years have been collecting this data, but not, not using it particularly efficiently. So we, we amalgamated all this yield data into a, a cross rotation performance, and we use that to select these 30 sites, 28 to 30 sites. So we've got areas in there that are high yielding, low yielding, and those varies between crops and different years. So the idea is to aim to quantify the relationship between the soil conditions and crop growth at these sites. This is often constrained by lack of data due to high cost and time demands. So we're going to try and figure out what we need to be measuring across farm at a fine spatial scale that then can be used to drive management decisions. So some of the things we're measuring, soil, the obvious sort of uh, penetration resistant, vesicle that David's mentioned, earthworms, sort of mineral N and P, K and MG and then bulk densities, water release characteristics curves, and then some plant populations, yield, and, and various other measures. So what are we learning? Obviously, we only just started this, but if we go back to our, our example of um, the, the pasture uh, and the arable conversion, we've got two sites that are, are in one M2, they're in Mansfield, has been in arable for pre-1946, and then Perones 2, uh, which is was in pasture prior to 1946, but has been in arable for at least 33 years. So the first thing we can look at is that actually there's no great difference in the soil mineral properties, as in their clay content. We can see here that we've basically got a sandy loam above, uh, above a sandy clay loam all the way to depth at all both those sites. So, so any variation we're seeing, we're not expecting it to be a variation of soil property, as a, of soil mineral components it's, it's going to be management and what else is affecting it so if we look at the organic matter this is where we start to see divergence m2 we were at 3.6 percent organic matter by loi and four and a half on prone so although only a one percent increase is actually a 25 percent relative increase in soil organic matter this is not all that surprising work at rothamsted shows when we convert from an arable uh, pasture to arable, it can take up to 60 years for the soil to return to an e equilibrium. 
So we're, we're, we're obviously well into that process, but we are still seeing significant differences. And what we are also seeing is, is that the significant, sorry, this is interesting. Obviously we're seeing those differences and we're seeing the difference in resilience, but what we need to carry on is monitoring over the next five, 10 years to see how our current arable practices are influencing that. So these are just two sort of mock scenarios that we could look at. We could be that over the last 30, 40 years of quite intense plowing seal rotations that we've, we've degraded soil organic matter to 4.5 and 3.6 M2. But actually the modern practices and on farm, they use quite a lot of manure. Plowing is only now used rotationally before sugar beet and all straw residues returned in manure. And then and tillage is, is often only to the top 10 centimetres. Are we seeing a, a buildup of organic matter across both sites? And is that increasing at M2 quicker than Perone's? P2, sorry. And what does that mean for resilience? Or is it, are we going the other way? Are management practices still degrading soil organic matter in P2, but we've, we've, we've reached a new equilibrium in M2? So we need to benchmark these properties now and then continuously monitor them over a number of years to see how what we are doing is improving resilience and improving the soil that we're working with. So we know the benefits of organic matter, the, the well documented, some AHTB literature documents that quite well. But what are we seeing at Morley in that 1% increase, the 25% relative increase? Well, we're seeing improvement in soil structure, particularly below 25 centers, below the cultivation layer. We're seeing where we've got that increase in organic matter, the soil penetration resistance diverges from 25 to 40 centimeters. And we can see there actually pretty much all the way down below 35 centimetres. We're not at a, a level of compaction that we expect to rest re restrict roots on P2, but we're well above that at 25 centimetres on M2. So we can see where this resilience might come from if we're trying to access moisture or let moisture through in wet years. And we also see a big reduction in bulk density, uh, nearly 0.3 grams per centimetre cubed, where we've got the higher organic matter. And we're also seeing higher levels of microbial activity here measured through the Solvita CO2 burst test. And all these measures will be repeated over a number of years, five, 10 years, to see how they diverge and are, are, are moving away. So one project, my PhD, that we've have recently started, so this is based at Cranfield, uh, centre funded, but I'm also continuing it with NIAB, using the data sets we're collecting at Morley. So the idea is that we're going to develop methods for integrating all these yield maps that farms have been collected, all the soil data and remote sensing data and weather data across a very high spatial resolution that we have at Morley to identify zones across the farm that are broadly similar. And then we can look at things such as the measurements we've described and, and try and identify what's driving this resilience and then how, for, how will that can then impact management as we go across different areas of the farm. Morley's a research center and has been for a number of years. So we have a lot of high resolution plot trial data. So the idea is that we're gonna use some of this trial data to, to validate and calibrate models that can then sort of predict what's going on at these specific areas that then could help drive management. And we'll build all this together into a, an integrated system that can see how fields and crops are performing across very fine spatial resolution and what management decisions, whether it's applying more organic matter, whether we can stabilize organic matter, whether it's nitrogen, erosion risk, and how we can tailor management decisions to better suit this. And a final piece of related work is a, a strategic cereal farm east. We're looking at marginal land. So again, using similar methods of, as we've described, using yield maps, uh, soil EC scans that have been across the farm for a number of years to try and identify parts of the farm that are not just performing very low. So if you remember to the early slide, that's sort of low across years, but also where these areas coincide with areas of high environmental risk. We see here the, the erosion risk map produced for the farm produced by the Norfolk Rivers Trust. So where we've got these low yielding areas and high environmental risk, this is where we might be able to implement schemes such as ELMS to maximize both the environmental benefit and minimize the economic impact on farm. So we've just started this out, so watch this space for this work. Thank you, that's all, all I've got to talk to today and look forward to some questions later. 
Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, I think that's going to be really important going forward. There's a lot of challenges about whether they be from the climate or from other factors that are uh, going to impact farming in the next few years. Um, there are some questions coming in and we will come back to those later and pick them up in the session. But for now, we'll move on and hear from our final speaker. It's Dr. Jake Bishop, who is going to discuss how we can ensure yield resilience going forwards and what the future could be. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, so um, Michelle's asked me to talk to you um, about how we might understand uh, what the threats are to food production. And then uh, using that knowledge, uh, how can we ensure yield resilience or try to ensure yield resilience as best we can? So I'm going to talk to you about these different topics uh, using different examples from my own research uh, and that of my research group and then the wider community at Reading and beyond. So I thought it'd be useful to start by looking at some data um, from the last three recent winters that we've had. Uh, so this is UK Met Office data. They produce these maps um, all the time. Uh, so you can log on to the website there and have a look for yourselves. So what these maps are showing, the left hand maps are showing rainfall in January to March. And then the right hand maps is temperature similarly. So if you've got a brown colour, that means that it's uh, been drier um, than the baseline period. And that baseline is 30 years from the 1980s to 2010. And a bluer colour is, is wetter. And then similarly for temperature, but blue is cooler and red is warmer. So if you look through these uh, these three years, then you can see it's been pretty variable and unpredictable between those three years. I'll leave it on 2020 because the, the long term trend, I think this shows the long term trend quite well, uh, is the annual temperature in the winter has increased. So that's a warmer winter that we heard about before. And um, precipitation has also increased. So that's the wetter winter. So just although we've got this, this unpredictability uh, year on year, the general trend um, seems to be that, yeah, we've been getting these warmer, wetter winters. Notice as well that it's quite variable spatially across the UK. And I'll talk about that a bit later as well. So what I'm showing you now is some data from the UK Met Office again. Uh, this is their climate projections that they released in, in 2018. And again, it's this warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers now as well. So, as I said, precipitation is non-uniform and it's quite difficult to predict, but they, they can do. And you can see the, the, the errors here as well. So first, um, I'll look at, talk about winter precipitation change projections. So this is for central England. Um, and they've been looking at 50 years ahead. So 2070 versus the baseline. So what you've got there, I've, I've, I've made this up based on what they what they put in the reports and numbers. Uh, so you've got no change in the middle and that's from the baseline. But you can see in the winter, despite what emission scenario they might pick, so that's despite best efforts of say climate mitigation that the government might be wanting to do, we're still going to be getting wetter winters by 2070. Similarly, despite the emission scenario, it looks like we're on track to be getting dry summers as well. You can see there's a lot of variability there, and in some cases you could be far drier than what we've been used to or far wetter in the winters as well. So I'll talk about temperature now. So we've got two different plots here. So the first one uh, in the top right, that line is showing the global average temperatures for each year. So zero, again, is the average for a baseline period. Again, that's something like from the 60s to the 90s, I think. So you can see that back in, say, 1884, then we are far below that baseline period in terms of average annual temperature. And as we've been getting um, closer to the present day, then it's been getting warmer and warmer. And you can see a particularly um, steep spike as we've got closer to the present day there. So as of 2018, when they released this particular data, 20 of the warmest years on record had been in the past 22 years. 
And you can sort of see that as well. This is in the bottom right, if we look at specifically at the UK specific data. Bluer represents cooler than average and redder represents warmer than average. So you've got lots of really deep reds there towards the present day. And that's showing this real sort of spike up to, uh, to hotter temperatures. And the five of the hottest years in the UK since um, 1884, were in sort of a 15 year period since 2006. So we've got that temperature data. How is it going to look for the future? Well, if you think back to 2018, now 2018 didn't appear on, on the, yeah, the, the record years because of the beast from the east that also occurred, so that affected the average temperature. But we had in 2018 a particularly and hot and dry summer. So again, it's the same principle. You've got, this is summer um, precipitation and, and temperature though, and it was much drier than normal and much hotter than normal. Now, according to the projections, by 2050, we've got a 50% chance of getting a summer like 2018. And again, that's irrespective of the emission scenario. And those only really start to play out and so you start to see a difference if you look out further into the future. But yeah, 50% probability of a summer like 2018 by 2050 sounds quite scary. But what we try and do in my research group is try and move from those weather projections through to something more meaningful for actually crop production. So I'm going to talk to you now about a study that one of my PhD students did, Caroline. And this is an agroclimate indicator study focusing in specifically on UK wheat. So what Caroline did is to look at the likelihood of 10 different uh, weather conditions, we call them adverse weather events, occurring across 25 different sites around the UK. And those sites are shown on that map, so they're spread across the UK and growing wheat growing region. So first of all, I'd show you this data that we that we produced looking at change in um, maturity in wheat. So what we've got first, are those little black lines that you can see, um, those are, were the baseline period, again, that I've been talking about before. And then the boxes show uh, 2050 projections. So we've got light and dark gray boxes. Um, those are showing uh, different emission scenarios, but the spread within those boxes or across those boxes is showing different um, climate model outputs. So we looked at 16 different uh, climate models, each of which is a plausible uh, representation of the future climate. And commonly you do this when you've got sort of a, a low certainty or there's lots of different things that can cause variability. And the useful thing here is to look at the, the median. Uh, so that's sort of what are all these different climate models projecting on. And they're, they're showing that on average, there's going to be a approximately 15 day um, uh, shortening in maturity. So, so that will bring the date of maturity forward. And that's similar for anthesis as well. So now if you look at a, a, a stress indicator, so I picked out two from the paper. Um, one of those is an extremely wet early season. So that's the crop. Uh, or the crop fields being at or above field capacity for an extended period of time in the early season. So you can see the probability of that has, it, it looks like it's going to increase. We've got pretty good certainty on that because all of those different um, climate models in some areas are, are above the baseline. So showing that we're going to have an increase in risk there. It's important to look at that at a spread of those boxes though and see how it's massively variable depending on where you are in the UK um, and also depending on the different climate model and the different assumptions that those make. So if we hold that in our heads and then look at the other graph which is showing heat stress from anthesis to maturity. So that looks on the, on the, on the face of it like good news that like we've got a low risk and especially when you compare that to other studies which have looked across Europe and they found in other in other countries in Europe the risk of heat stress is, uh, is a lot higher. But this is a study that's focused on winter wheat so we need to actually be able to get the wheat in the ground and have it survive um, before it gets to anthesis or maturity. 
So even though we might be getting this advancement that I showed you on the previous slide, we need to be able to get the thing in the ground first and have it have it successfully emerge. So I'll talk to you about a different project. So in, in the previous, uh, in, in Caroline's work, then we had to, um, we were using these different agroclimate indicators from experimental research that people had done. But then the project I'll talk to you about now, this is, um, we're actually using the data to learn those responses. So this project is called SimFarm 2030. So originally this is um, a small project funded by the Science and Technology Funding Council. Um, but it's now moved on and we're funded by AHDB for a PhD studentship. And Anissa started her PhD um, about a, a month ago at the University of Sussex. So what this project is doing um, is I'm the crop, the crop person, um, but we're working with some astrophysicists who, who do all this sort of machine learning um, science. We're using AHDB crop trials data, so from the recommended list data set. And we're pairing that with historic weather data from all of those different uh, AHDB trial sites. So we've got, say, the yield data. We've also got quality data. We've got that for different varieties. And we're using that to, via a machine learning algorithm, to learn a um, temperature and precipitation response for wheat. And hopefully we're going to be able to get it down to being a variety or cultivar specific temperature and precipitation response. So then what we'll do, we validate that against a known yield for those sites. Uh, so it's handy that we've got that. And then what I'm going to show you is we, we're starting to look at developing some different visualization tools from, from those models as well from, yeah, from this machine learning algorithm. Um, so take those with a pinch of salt when I show you because it's, it's obviously just started as a project, but I thought it'd be useful to show you some of those. So first, I'll show you this. Uh, these are the, the um, temperature and precipitation responses that the model has learnt so far. So what these are, we've got temperature on the left and we've got precipitation on the right. These are all different possible relationships between temperature and yield or precipitation and yield. Um, and then the middle, and you can just about make it out, we've got a red distribution there, and that's the, that's the middle scenario or the median, similar to what I talked about with the, with the climate models before. So, th so this model works on a month-by-month -month basis, so it, it sort of slowly accumulates yield over the growing season. Um, I'll move on. So those lines that we've got in the middle of the plot going across is the UK average. And this is this is the sort of the model that's come out from the recommended list data so far. So you can see the yield would be a bit higher per month. So more yield would be accumulated per month if we were a bit warmer than the UK average. And if we're a bit drier than the UK average. And that makes sense if you think about where we are and how in the south and east yield is typically higher. So perhaps not so surprising at the moment, but we're hoping to be able to refine this model and be able to incorporate more data. So looking at soil type data, and because it's really flexible, it's based on the data rather than based on any underlying assumptions that we might have, then we could tailor it to other crops as well, or we can tailor it for variety specific, as I've talked about. So we've just been using this for now to look at the impacts of some weather scenarios. But like I said, take these with a pinch of salt. Uh, we've got 2015 uh, UK wide um, yields in the top left there. And then we played around with different things. So what if you reduce the, the precipitation or increase the temperature by a degree? And then we had a sort of a catastrophic scenario just to, just to see what the model did. So that's a big increase in average temperature across the uh, and a big de decrease in, in precipitation as well. So you can see that that did result in a lowering of yield. Now, the sort of thing that we're hoping to be able to do, and that's what Anissa is going to be working on largely through the project, is using this, to, this as a tool to help us with appropriate cultivar selection. So like I said, we're, be, we're, we're going in with, or putting into the model, cultivar specific data. And then we can get that out so we can compare the traits of different crops or we can compare cultivars across 
the UK. So they've been grown in these different trial sites. Um, but we can map out how they're going to yield or how we expect them to yield across the rest of the UK and under different climate scenarios. So say there we're comparing the benefits of having a, a warm adapted or a cool adapted um, cultivar. And that's just a hypothetical cultivar where we've shifted the, those different normal distributions um, left or right a bit. So that sounds like data is going to solve all our problems, but I'm an experimental scientist as well. And I think that there's still a need for targeted experiments. So for one thing, extreme events that we've been talking about, they're very rare. So it's actually quite difficult to get sufficient data at those extremes because they occur rarely. Also, there's really sort of subtle differences in responses at times, but those can be really important. Uh, so this is some experimental data from uh, Henry, he's now working at KWS. Um, this is published in 2014, and Henry was comparing two different wheat cultivars, Renaissance and Savannah. So what he was doing, he was doing, he had the plants growing outside, and then he moved them into controlled environments for 24-hour periods. So each plant got one 24-hour period of stress. So that was either going into a 20-degree day or a 35-degree day. Then he compared the difference between those two different temperatures for the yield. So that was really to look at, OK, what was the most susceptible 24 hours across 30 days for these two different cultivars? And what he found is that these two different cultivars had different susceptible stages. So one of them was susceptible or most susceptible to high temperature at booting. And one of them was most susceptible to temperature at, um, at anthesis. So that's quite important knowledge. And what, what Henry moved on to doing was looking at what was actually causing that difference in susceptibility. So it's quite different to get difficult to get that out from these sort of big data sets where you would have needed a stress at anthesis and a stress at booting uh, differently in different sites. Um, so that's why we we still have this need for doing these experimental uh, experimental studies as well. So a different experiment, I'm going to talk to you about two, two of our experiments which have been going on at Reading or studies which have been going on at Reading. So first is the EU liberation experiment. So this started in 2013. And this was looking at um, the effects of different amounts of rotational diversity. So getting more crop species or other species into an arable rotation. And specifically, what I'm going to talk to you about is an, an experiment that was done in 2015. But first, I think it's useful to give you a bit of a bit of an overview. So you can see that we've got these different um, what are basically blocks of four, um, so four fields. And so what we've got there is it's a four year rotation. So at any given time in any year, then we've got each year in the rotation represented there. So Sam and Eric are PhD students uh, who are looking at measuring different ecosystem services in these plots. And they decided in 2015 um, to put some polytunnels over the wheat plots. So there was a wheat represented in each of those different experimental rotations. And these polytunnels, the idea of those was to block out rainfall and to slightly increase the temperature. So even though they did that in 2015, it ended up being a good representation of the 2018 summer. So if we look at what, um, what the experimental rotations had been for those particular plots um, for the past two years, those had been for the simple rotation that had just all been wheat. The moderate rotation, a bit more like a conventional rotation had had oilseed rape the previous year. And then this diverse rotation, this shows you the sort of thing that we were trying to do. Um, that was having, say, a legume mix under sown in the wheat, and then the brassica cover crop the year before, which then went into spring beans. So what was the outcome of those different rotational diversities for, for the wheat that was grown in the rotation? Well, they found that increased rotational diversity reduced the effect of drought on wheat yield. So this sounds quite similar to what we've been hearing from our other speakers. So you can see there in control conditions, then the moderate or conventional rotation, uh, those plots yielded 
the best under control conditions. But the diverse plots weren't far behind. And then when it was stressful conditions, they were under those polytunnels, the diverse plots retained a lot more of that yield than the others did. And the PhD students working on this, they, they, they put that down to greater water retention in those diverse plots under the, uh, under the drought conditions. And they measured canopy temperature, so that was how plot how, how hot the, the plants were getting. So that's a sort of a real life measure of plant stress, uh, or how hot it is relative to the environment, or to what extent it can cool itself. So if a plant's got more water, then it can cool itself more. And the diverse plants, um, they were keeping themselves cool and closer to the control temperatures. Whereas the moderate and the simple uh, rotation plants, they were getting a lot hotter and a lot more stressed for the same amount of a sort of rainfall restriction. So finally, I'd like to talk to you about another bit of work that my uh, PhD student Caroline is doing. So this is an, another set of data analysis um, using at this time the DEFRA Farm Business Survey data set. So Caroline's been looking at a study period from 2007 to 2015. We're not actually explicitly in this study, so this was just accepted um, last week in Agricultural Systems Journal. We weren't looking at climate specifically, but the study period, uh, if you remember those stressful years, or you know those worst years since 1884, that study period covers pretty well uh, those hot record hottest years. And we've been looking at um, the stability of farm income across more than 2,000 farms across England and Wales. There's about 2,000 farms in each year. And then we're looking at what is special about those different farms. So the more, um, more stable farms with more stable income between years, um, what characteristics did they have? So then we can hopefully learn from those and sort of uh, encourage uh, that more people take on these different practices. So what came out? Well, the, the more uh, the farms which have sort of spread their portfolio across a, a greater number of crop and livestock, uh, they had greater income stability. The bigger farms as well had more stable incomes. And interestingly, if we think about what I was talking about before with, with ecosystem services and these liberation trials, the farms which received more uh, income through agri-environment payments also had more stable incomes. And that contrasted with um, direct payments. So it didn't really matter how much direct payments farms got in terms of stability. And in fact, actually, the more um, direct payments that you got, then the less stable the income was. So although these are meant to be some sort of measure for helping farms be more resilient, it seemed like direct payments under CAP were reducing stability to some extent and agri-environment payments, which specifically were linked to, you know, having, say, wildflower strips at the edge of field or conducting, um, make, making sure that your, your soil is in better health. Those were the things which were actually paying off in terms of stability. Also, you see that input use intensity was negatively associated with, with income stability. And we found quite a poor correlation as well between input use intensity, so the amount of money that uh, farms were spending on um, fertiliser and agrochemicals and yield and income. So that's interesting as well. And we think that's because, especially with the hot years during the period, you can be making all of that investment, but then it will fail to pay off um, if your crop, gets, say, get, encounters heat stress or a long dry summer. So what we're going to move on to next for the last bit of work for Caroline's PhD project is we're going to now specifically link the, um, the, the farm yield data and the farm income data with weather data from individual farms. So what we're going to be able to, to hopefully do is build this sort of relationship that I've tried to show here. So you've got uh, farm income against extremity of weather. So you say farm A, as the weather gets more extreme, then, then farm income goes down. And we want to find those the specific characteristics that mean that there's a smaller relationship. So they change the relationship between weather extremity and farm income. So you might end up with a, 
a less steep relationship. So that would mean a more consistent farm income and more consistent yield or resilient yield, as our speakers have talked about, um, no matter what the weather. And that's what we're aiming for. So I thought I'd end with um, some key messages. It looks like we've got continued variability and that's going to stay there. That's what the UK projections say is that we're going to still have variability, but the trend is going to be for these warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers are more likely as well. But as I hope you, you'll agree uh, from myself and the other speakers, adaptation can help to reduce those negative impacts. So say adjusting our cultivars or changing uh, how we irrigate or how we fertilize or when we plant crops. There's some of the examples I've shown you as well, better access to data uh, that we're starting to get nowadays can help us to guide adaptation. But there's lots of work still to do. And I think there's still a place there for experimental research as well. So I'd like to end with some acknowledgements and pass over to, to Michelle. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jake. That was brilliant to get an idea of the research that's being done and where the future could could be in terms of crop resilience. Um, so we have had quite a few questions come in. So um, I think the best thing to do, we are a little bit ahead of time, but I don't think that will be a problem having looked at the list of questions. Um, I think it would be great if we can bring all the speakers back in and have a look at some questions. So um, my first one is one that I'm particularly interested in because it's a mindset question more than anything. And it's originally to David Blacker, but actually um, I'll see if you other guys have got um, an insight into it. But would you do anything differently, David, if you approached each season expecting it, expecting the worst instead of potentially hoping for it to be better than last year type mindset question for you then? Would you change anything if you plan differently? Uh, well, we, we've, we've had two wet seasons on the bounce now, um, up and down the country, not just Yorkshire. Um, so the only thing the only thing I, I did differently this year was get me thinking about when I was planting to make sure I had a crop in the ground. Um, obviously, you've got black grass. That's not the answer you want to you want to hear. Get crops drilled early. So there is no easy answer other than. You know, keep keep improving your soil, keep improving your structure, keep improving your drainage, and and build on that that system. And I saw that in fifteen when I lost some crops in fifteen. I just hadn't been doing it for long enough to have a resilient enough soil to deal with what was thrown at us that season. So you just got to keep going at it. Brilliant. And do you think that there are things that you could do differently? Are there things that every farmer could take away in all of you could have an answer for this? Is there something that all farmers could be doing now to help build that resilience, small or big? What are your thoughts on that? I suppose um, if you want, wanted me to start, I suppose that the idea is, is to actually monitor and understand what resilience looks like on their farm. So very similar to what David uh, Blacker talked of when he, when he had his nice Excel sheet of all his fields with yields. Just those simple exercises to understand where there might be issues, but also where where is going well and what fields are working and seem to be forming over a very stable period of time. Going having a look, testing and finding out what's driving that and then implementing that on those fields that are identified of not being so resilient. So I think identifying good and bad is a good starting point and then then thinking about what, what needs to be done to, to address that is the second option or the second part. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd, yeah. I'd agree with that totally. Uh, work out your costs. If you, if you don't know what your costs are, you're just farming blind, really. Um, get involved in your local benchmarking group and should find out where your weaknesses are and build on that. I think I agree with both as well. I think that, that echo wouldn't say that... that um, that pre the, the, the last research that I showed you as well, looking at say the, those having high intensity doesn't necessarily pay off. You need to be looking at where where it's just not working and maybe reduce inputs there. So that would mean that you're risking less as well. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to jump on David's uh, plug and uh, just have a quick mention of our farm bench system, um, which is a great tool for 
benchmarking um, and understanding cost of production. And I would encourage anybody who isn't to have a look and see whether they can get involved with that. Um, talking of costs, uh, we got a question from you, David. How much did you spend on drainage? Oh, so so the equipment itself, I probably spent it was a fair bit, probably about eighty grand buying all the equipment to do everything with. Uh, so that you know, trenches, stone cart, um, everything that goes with it, all the GPS, laser guided kit. Uh, so that was a lot of money per acre per hectare. That I think the cheapest field I've done for myself was about six fifty an acre. Uh, so that's sixteen hundred a hectare, and the most expensive was about eleven hundred an acre. Um, so that's what 2,700 a hectare uh, and a lot of that really comes down to how deep you put the drains and how much stone you put on them it's the stone that's the expensive bit uh, whether you're doing it yourself or you're getting a contract to do it the stone costs a lot of money uh, so you find out you know I found out very quickly um, I only just want the drains deep enough to do what they're going to do putting a putting a drain in uh, six foot deep just because you can uh, ends up costing you three times as much in stone so you may as well just put them two foot deep and, and leave them there. Brilliant. And sticking with finances, um, and although the compost didn't give you a financial benefit, it's given you a benefit in terms of consistency and hitting the farm average every year. Do you think that could be something that you would look at again? Is it is it a good enough reason to keep doing it, do you think? Yeah, it is definitely. I mean, that... What that field showed for me was, um, even though I wasn't seeing a financial benefit at the end of it, you know, I did have a field that was so far and away better than the rest of that block and how the crops survived in it and how they came out of winter looking bigger and lusher and more tiller retention. Um, I was so convinced that that was the right way to go. I then started rolling the compost out around the rest of my blocks of land. So, yeah, it is something that if I can get the compost and I can get it a sensible enough price, yeah, and you know, it's not a wet season where you can spread it without causing great ruts and soil compaction, then absolutely I'll be doing it every year. Brilliant. And a question to both David. It's handy that you're both called David. It makes this all very much easier. Um, is all about bulk density and how you measured it. We'll go to David Sorry. Clark first. Sorry. Go to mix it up, David Backer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so on in our trials and experiments, we use just a simple bulk density ring. So we're, we're just taking a, a, a ring of soil that we know the volume, drying it and weighing it. We also remove stone because Morley is quite a stony site. So it's quite important to adjust for the stone content because if you've got one or two stones in your sample, then suddenly it's, it's going to be quite severely impacted by that. Um, but there are, you know, although it's, not that expensive to do for us we, you know we only got one core and if farmer wanted to get their own core or ring it it, sh it wouldn't be that much in terms of capital cost and you just need an oven to dry on so as long as you don't mind putting soil in your kitchen oven that should be fine but um the there are other ways of doing it in terms of, sort of working out with bags of water they're all online i won't describe the methods here but yeah we're mainly using bold density rings um and then adjusting for stone content which is important if you've got a high stone stone content because if not you'll just get very 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 numbers and, and not learn too much from them yeah i'm doing exactly the same as that i just bought my own ring um it wasn't a lot of money i just trolled the internet and found one that cost about 15 quid uh so i just do it myself in exactly the same fashion but it's an interesting point because a lot of the labs um aren't doing it like that you know unless they have get the actual sample that comes out of that ring they can't do you a proper bulk density assessment on it so in that situation they're making assumptions based on either cell type or organic matter uh, and more often not it will come out at 1.3 but it's not an accurate reading it's an assumption of what you should have brilliant and sticking with soil testing um are the soil organic matter measurements using loss and information as accurate as the DMAS method? So I'm not going to comment so much on the accuracy. I don't know enough about it. But what I will know is that LOI, certainly the most variable thing is how we sample and where we sample and when we sample. So both, both methods work very well. But what's more important is that you use the same method every time you, you sample. 
use the same site so not just sort of the w across the field i'd recommend particularly with organic matter not so much p and k but if you're looking at how a system is affecting soil organic matter over time going to the same points in the field and measuring at the same point so you're taking out any in variation across the field um and then also making sure you're doing it at the same point in the rotation so if it's in the autumn before a winter wheat it's in the same crop you've got the same sort of residue distribution in the soil and trying to avoid that in the sample so i think the method's not so much important the, the advantage of loi as well for us in the uk that ahtb with the great um soils project have just released some benchmarking values that are based on the specific soil type so you can use them with loi um so yeah I, I think most importantly is just do the same thing every time you test it and test it regularly great um coming over to jake for a few questions i think now um you've had a easy run for a few minutes and managed to uh, have a few moments after your presentation um but the first one is about how accurate your weather predictions are um and i don't know uh, how much you want to say on that other than the but go for it <laughs> Yeah, it's a difficult one to, to know, really. So I, I can talk about different different types of work. So if, if I think about Caroline's project, um, and why we're looking at the wheat uh, stress maps, those adverse weather conditions, you have to make assumptions uh, whenever you're producing those kind of uh, those kind of assessments. So we have to assume one sowing date and one um, particular soil depth across the UK. So if you think about that then that might suggest that you'd get different responses in different places but we were already cramming a lot more into that paper than lots of other people might have been looking at say, just one site across the uk so it's sort of picking and choosing where you where you have the reliability and making sure that you're clear about um where there is less reliability i suppose that's why we're trying to show those different climate models as well so each of those is like a plausible a plausible future. You take the median of those because that gives you the idea of what they're all centering on. But it's important to think, well, one one climate modeling group might have got got it right. It could be one of those furthest away models as well. Brilliant. And then we talked a lot about the UK and that was where all the data was coming from. But what are your thoughts, probably Jake and David, on what lessons we can learn from other countries? I think we can learn a, a lot, really. So I talked about the. Well, so it's one advantage of looking for other countries is that I talked about how extreme events are quite rare, and actually in other countries, then you might be having those extreme events. If you think, say Australia, then you frequently got a lot of dry, uh, a lot of dryness and a lot of heat. And um, so it might we can look to those sort of studies. Uh, or data from from countries outside the UK to parameterize models at least. But it's important also to keep in mind that say the crop crop that they'll be growing are very different as well. So mm -hmm. might respond slightly differently. Brilliant. Have you got any thoughts on growing different crop varieties that are potentially drought tolerant and things like that? Um, they do it in Africa with maize. Um, whether it be through GM or um, other breeding techniques, what are your thoughts on that? And is that the future? Is that for me or everyone? Uh, we'll start with you. If anyone else has got anything to add, please do feel free. I think an issue, an issue might be um, the variability in weather. So I think that it's fine if you can get a drought resistant crop, but it needs to be able to yield well as well when you've got those good years. And it needs to, say, not be um, flooding, susceptible to flooding in the winter as well. So because we've got these variable conditions, we need to sort of, I think that's where diversity comes in and sort of spreading the portfolio is, might be more sensible than sort of putting all our eggs in this in a drought tolerant basket and missing out on the other stresses. I think, I think, sorry, yeah, just so talking about the resilience of the system as a whole, that's where things like variety and different cropping and rotation comes into it that, you know, if, you, if you're growing, you know, tons and tons of, well, the oat example for us, you know, oats, if I had all, if we had, you know, 
400 hectares of oats on farm would have been in trouble this year because of the storm we had but if we have the wider rotation plenty of crops spread out across so we're harvesting them on time we aren't leaving them in the field to be vulnerable that's i think just as well important of building resilience that than picking a variety that may you know mature three or four days earlier so we can get it off the field earlier it's actually if we're at it at the right time and we have a, a system that can can deal with those challenges in a resilient manner that's perfect and it leads me to one of the questions that was um asked for david blacker and it was with all the drainage are you then going to be worried about the adverse effect and then potential future droughts um and i don't know whether david's got any and it's probably for both david's and what how you build resilience for both Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the drains really are gonna, only going to take the excess water. They're not, they're not going to make uh, the field so dry. You can't grow anything. They're just taking everything over and above field capacity. So you're gonna, still going to have plenty of moisture there for your, for your crop to grow in. You're just getting rid of the excess you don't want. And David Park, have you got any thoughts about if we do too much drainage, are we going to cause ourselves issues in the future with, with drought? Um, but I, suppose, I think David's answered that very well there. I think what we will say is actually a lot of these, if we have a system that's resilient to drought, so for example, the organic matter example that I've alluded to and David alluded to, actually will tend to be that will be resilient. The benefits that we see from that, soil structure, improved nutrient availability, improved water holding capacity, improved structure and infiltration will actually work when we've got a dry year and when we've got a wet year, it'll help water get away and it'll hold it when we need it. So resilience systems will tend to, and the things that we do to build resilience will probably, well, will help us whether the resilience is dry, wet, a lot of the time. Brilliant. And um, somebody's asked if you've ever, if David Black, you've ever considered agroforestry to help as a tool to help with excess water. Um, and I'm going to put a cheeky sales pitch in here. There is a session tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, and Stephen Briggs will be speaking about agroforestry and that. So if that is something that you're interested in, do check that out. But what are your thoughts on agroforestry, David? Uh, yeah, I've never, I've never actually considered it myself. It's always been one of those areas of VAG where I've been quite happy stood on the outside looking in rather than being on the inside looking out. Um, uh, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just not convinced, really, it's uh, it's right for me or how it's going to improve my system to any great extent. Brilliant. Um, and have you seen any changes in, have you changed the varieties that you grow, David, because of the weather? Have you looked at different options? Has that, has it caused a change in variety selection, do you think? Not, not so much, only in that to go for earlier ripening varieties now to give yourself a bigger window to get them cut uh, but i suppose a big driver for any varietal change i've had is more going down from strip tillage and having wide seams that need a big canopy to fill the gaps rather than um you know a conventionally drilled crop that's on seven and a half or 12 15 centimeters uh, that's been more of a driver for me than than the climate has get you know getting crops drilled early and getting a good roots establishment on them will do you probably more than any any varietal tweak would mentioning the early ripening um jake you mentioned the potential 15 day reduction in um, date of maturity um is it going to be a problem do you think how what do you think is going to be the biggest problem with that yeah i've seen this uh, this this bringing forward of anthesis and of maturity uh, I think it's got pros and cons. So, so a big a big pro of having this earlier maturity is that you miss out on the the particularly hot and dry weather. So, although the projections are showing that it's going to be really really hot in the summer, really dry, if you it, the, the, it looks like we we weren't encountering heat stress in the models because the crops were maturing before that came in. So it's good for that reason. Um, but if you've got something which is maturing too quickly. Then there are bottlenecks in in the plant as well, so you can't um, you know you can't actually get that much sugar into the grains. Um, it's it's not an infinite um, it's not an infinitely large pipeline through. 
So only, yeah, there's some limit there. So a crop can't say develop in two days and then and then be just the same as it would have been if it had developed over a nice long period and had a relaxed time of it. Um, in terms of anthesis, I think, yeah, again, in terms of escape, it seems like that's a good thing to have anthesis coming forward so long as you don't have uh, too many late frosts. Linked to the change in the climate potentially if it's going to become warmer and more humid um do you think there's going to be impacts in pests and this will probably relate to um i don't know whether david has seen that he started trying to get crops in the ground sooner in winter oh, there's going to be implications to how we manage pests um and how you think that's going to change going forwards Yeah, I think, I think we're going to get more slugs, we're going to get more aphids, uh, potentially more disease. You're warmer and wetter, it's just got disease written all over it. We haven't seen that in the last few seasons because they've been quite hot and dry in, in the right times as well. But, um, you know, grass weed pressure, there's going to be a lot more pressure because of the weather. And it's it's about managing your system, really, and how you, how you want to farm. And um, aphids are... Uh, largely resistant to everything we've got anyway so um when i can't travel because it's too wet i'm tending not to worry about it too much thinking that they're not going to do a, a good spoon them anyway and <laughs> um, jacob and david have you got any thoughts i think all the projections show that we are going to be getting more and more um, pest and disease trouble yeah um yeah this this the same thinking about trends and then into projections then there's been some some well-known papers coming out which have shown that yeah, you're getting increased pest migration as well so sort of moving out um away from the pole so you're getting more and more pest species being encountered as these things are, you know the, the climate is getting better suited to new pests so we might see things that we haven't seen before brilliant david any thoughts before we um, um not my area expertise but i will say um i think what will how we've used to deal with resilience in terms of we you know we had metaldehyde and, and various products for slugs that you know were, were a resilient way of dealing with them we're going to have to start looking at other ways whether it's managing cultivations managing residue um but i will say if, if, if people are interested that's the sort of work that we're doing on the strategic farm east not me personally but now i have an ahdb so um at brian barker's looking at sort of flowering strips and in, 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 in trying to encourage beneficials so things like that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to sort of provide an offset and build some resilience to the system at the moment how it's all going to look and, and fit together i think that's where the research needs to to fill in those gaps so hopefully over the next sort of three or four or five years that trial and other trials and other people are doing i know there's plenty going on john innes and bbro in terms of the yellow virus there's a lot of work looking at resistance varieties and, and how we can improve soil to improve pest management so i think watch this watch this space but um from a personal point of view, I, I, I don't know enough about it. I think following up on that, there's a lot of potential for win-wins. So that liberation experiment that we talked about, that, that showed that they had that wheat, you know, it's making wheat more drought tolerant, or it appeared to be. They're also measuring the sort of the pest control that was provided in those different rotations as well. And so that also links, say, with, with the farm business survey um, study that we were doing. It was those agri-environment uh, practices which are associated with um, farm income stability as well. So if you can do something which is benefiting your pest control, as well as benefiting your, your income through some other means potentially, then, then that's a win-win and we need to find those, those different solutions. Related to um, disease control, um, within the model, Jake, within your simple model and diverse rotations, did you look at the effect of take all um, and whether it, could have helped contribute to the differences in yield. Um, obviously with healthier root structures, you'd get better water uptake. I don't think they did. They, they looked at soil moisture and they looked at, say I said about pest controls, they looked at aphid incidents, but I don't think they did aphid counts, but I don't think they looked at um, diseases. But I can go away and read the paper and get back to people <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And do you think it would be possible to model a potential of a crop in early spring ahead of the summer harvest to make more informed decisions 
in terms of how much you're going to spend on a crop in the pursuit of the best yield you could manage um, using weather predictions and modelling. I think there's a there's an awful lot of research going into that. Yeah, so there's a lot of money to be made as well, if you can imagine. So that's that's compared to say the longer distance um, forecasting. There's been a, there's a lot of research being done on this within your your stuff because you can imagine that it's going to affect commodity prices. So you can get people being very interested in that and also in, uh, using it to price insurance for crops. So yes, I think it is possible, and there's lots of work being done there. I think whether that becomes available for farmers compared to, or agronomists compared to say insurance companies that's the that's the question really good point um going back a few steps and it relates to the future of funding and things like that um it was originally asked to david blacker so do you think that land drainage grants should be part of the uk's new subsidy scheme um making farming more sustainable uh yeah it's interesting it's an interesting question that um when you know when michael gove had his big consultation and you know farmers were being berated quite a lot about not being productive enough you know the one thing on farm that would make a farm more productive would be to have the field drains put right and the fields performing i mean i've seen yield increases of 30 40 percent from a, an area that would you know, after I drained it, it was almost transformed the field. So, so from that respect, uh, productive point of view, it's a no-brainer, absolute no-brainer to fund that to make farmers more productive. And not only that, but from the environmental perspective, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on greenhouse, uh, global warming and greenhouse gases and nitrous oxide and waterlogged soils just play straight into that argument. Uh, in that you know you should be encouraging that just to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide being given off by water log soils. Any thoughts on that, David Clark? Um, it's a, it's. I think David's answered it very well. Personally, um, yeah, I, I think like David said that it, the benefits of drainage in terms of on the crop and then an, an environment risk does have other you know positive and negatives, but. Um, in the long run, a, a field that handles water efficiently is, is going to be both best for the environment and best from a productive point of view. As soon as we start getting ponding and, and, and runoff on off, across the soil surface, we bring in other risk factors such as the soil erosion and the loss of phosphates um, and things like that. So, so and ensuring our fields are, are are capable of dealing with the water and whatever that will be that season is an important factor in both productivity and environmental risk. And I've got one question, which is slightly off topic, but I'd be interested in your answers anyway. Um, and it's why do you think some people are so resistant to change? <laughs> um, it's more about that mindset. If you approached each year thinking it would be better, is that the answer? And why do you think people are so resistant? And I'll put that to all of you because it'd be interesting to see what you think. We'll start with David Blacker. You've changed quite a lot. Why do you think people don't? Uh, I'm not sure that there is a one thing to change out there. I think people are just getting a getting a comfort zone of doing things how they've always done it, um, and you know they maybe just need to step back from that and ask themselves why are they doing it like that, and you know start to question it a bit more rather than just taking it for granted that this is how it should be done on their farm. Brilliant, David Clark. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure people are generally resistant to change, but I think it's important for, from our point of views as researchers, um, Jake and, and myself, and then even and David, what he's doing is it's important for us to actually get messages across clearly, because I think there can be a lot of, you know, you need to do this, but you also need to do this. A lot of pull, and we've just touched on it with the field drainage. There's a lot of push and pull, so it's very hard to change if you're not actually sure how the best way to change is. So I think turning it back on myself and, and research, I think some of that comes back on our shoulders to, to, to better sort of show what what change should be. And, and I think there's, it's important that we make sure we make the right change and, and we're not just changing for the sake of changing. Uh, brilliant answer. Have you got anything to add on that, Jake? Uh, I'd agree with both. I think that somebody could look like they're being resistant to change, but they're not really resistant. They might not have the time to, to you know to go through and yeah 
well, it takes a lot of time investment, let's say, to learn to grow a new crop and things like that, and also a big monetary investment potentially. And also having access to information. There's lots of information out there, and hopefully we're doing stuff to make that more accessible. Um, but you'll yeah, you'll see there's lots of variability in that information. It's quite difficult to see through and to know what you're changing towards when it could be so variable. Yeah. Amazing. So those trends isn't it yeah and that leads me to my final question and i'm going to put you all on the spot and i'm going to ask you all whether you think we could get to the point where the our systems are so resilient that the climate doesn't have a massive impact anymore where whether it be through making the most of opportunities through elms or making the most of our farms and sorting out all of our drainage and getting ourselves to the point where we're growing varieties in a way that is the future do you think we could get to the point where the weather doesn't matter go on then david blacker no i don't think so <laughs> if it doesn't if it doesn't rain your crops are going to die unless you've got irrigation you know i mean there's yeah. things we can do to build into the system to lessen it but uh ultimately you know when it rains constantly and doesn't stop or uh, never rains you know it's putting so much pressure on the systems and the plants we're trying to grow it, it's hard to see that we'll ever get to a point where we can just sit back and put the sunnies on and um, not worry about it <laughs> david clark um no i think you know we're always going to have that risk and we're always going to have risks but what we can do and, and from the things that we've talked about today um is, is minimize that risk and, and potentially spread it over a number of seasons and, and and actually you know with david and his drainage is, is build some resilience to that but just being aware that there's that risk there is, is a good point and, and somewhere to start isn't it because then you're not making decisions going blindly into the future brilliant and jake i think the davids have covered it very well <laughs> I think, yeah that's we can um we can't be you know independent of the weather no but we can there's people out there doing very sensible things which are helping to unlink you from weather, but you, we're always going to be linked to some extent. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all for your input. Um, it, we've reached the end of our session and all I have left to do is a little bit of a close. So um, thank you all for presenting. Um, there's some really interesting work going on and it's going to be really important in the future going forwards. And thank you all for attending and listening and sending in all your great questions. Um, it wouldn't be a session without the engagement from the audience. Um, I think that the climate is going to be one to watch as much as a part of me would like the hotter, drier summers. There's obviously always going to be an impact and that's going to be on food production. And we need to ensure that we've got the most resilient systems we have so that we can carry on in the future. Um, please. Can I remind everybody, if you can, please complete the feedback um, on the session form by scrolling down just underneath this window. Um, also at the bottom of the page, there are some relevant publications that you can download. There's a copy of the drainage guide um, and the soil management guide, which um, uh, David Clark used some bits from, and the crop growth guides. Um, also attached there is a copy of the HDB Arable Research Review, which contains all of the research that we're doing um, along with dates and things like that. And you can find out what projects are going on. Remember to apply for your basis and Neuroso points by completing the form on the left hand menu. Um, you'll need to enter the unique code, which is shown on the screen now. So for basis, it's B14B and Neuroso, it's N14B. So you can do that at any point during this agronomy week, but I would encourage you to all get that done. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this agronomy week session and the next live stream coming up is looking at uh, ecolo ecological principles for weed management, which starts at five o'clock. But you can also check out the on-demand sessions throughout this week. And I would encourage you to do that. And it includes things like our PhD review. If you've got any questions and you'd like to get in contact, we're all available through the chat function on the Agronomy Week platform. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, this is gonna be a really interesting area of research and I look forward to hearing from some of you soon. Thanks for joining. Bye.